And good morning, church. It is good to see you. Yes, sir, brother. Ann. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Good testimony this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. Couldn't help but to stand up and say something. I love that. That's so good. It is good to be in the house of the Lord with you this morning. Uh, certainly the Lord is in this place. You can feel his presence. Amen. Um, when you look at your Bibles this morning, find chapter 7 of the book of Luke. And let's look at what it means to be a friend of sinners. We've talked about relationships and how they're a relative. And last week we looked at uh, the Word of God when it talked about how we're supposed to love the Lord thy God with everything that we've got. And we noticed that relationships hinge upon the word love. Uh, there's some people, church, as you know it, we got to love them. Um, we, you know, just like your jobs, uh, you got to love it. Uh, sometimes seem like um, uh, to be able to do it and to keep on doing it. And so we're going to look at relationships this morning and how they are relative. But I want us to look at, we went from, we're going from one extreme to the other. We're going from God and his holiness all the way to a sinner. There are, this is polar opposites. This is opposite ends of the spectrum. And so we're going to look at this, and, and I want you to know today that if you're here and you've never, ever asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to come into your heart, that this would be like the most awesome day to do that. Um, we would love nothing more than for you to give your heart and life to the Lord today. I don't want you just to know him or know about him but I want you to engage in a relationship that is the most relative relationship there is because you can't love sinners and be a friend of sinners unless you have first fallen in love with the one who died for them all. And so I want you to know today that in this house, we welcome anybody and everybody, no matter what your past is. Uh, we try to make that very... Uh, very evident, very obvious, and uh, I don't want to just be repetitious about it, but I want you to know that everybody's welcome here. Uh, and if you're not welcome here, then I'm not welcome here. Um, and so, I'll give you a quick example before we read the word in Luke 7. There was a Sunday morning, and this was during the time or the era that we had the wall up right here. You know, there was a wall that went from this beam uh, this plywood or this wrapped around this column or this beam and there's one directly from it there And so we had this half was gymnasium or recreation still had a basketball goal because we used to have basketball goals on either end And on this side over here we deemed it as our worship center or our church or whatever you want to call it. Church or the people anyway, it's just if we are gathered in his name we'll have church But we were over here on this side and so we're having service and this was probably I don't know, I'm, I'm terrible about past timelines. You're like, I might tell you it happened six months ago, but it was like a year and a half ago. I'm, I really am. So if I ever lie to you like that, it's not intentional. I mean, it was my best estimated guess. I, I'm terrible about that. Um, so anyway, uh, that's my alibi. That's my story. I'm sticking to it, but really I am terrible. But, but we looked at this, this building, and we had this set up, and it was growing, and praise the Lord. And, and how many of you were here uh, during the time of the uh, the wall being up, you can remember the wall being up. Raise your hands, Amen, Amen. You know that's great because only about half of us raised our hands, so the other half says, "Nope, I don't know what you're talking about, but I believe you," um, and I'm glad that you do. But we put this wall up here, so we were trying, we were growing. The sanctuary wouldn't hold us. We were over here having worship, and then how many of you remember? So we we uh, we we jutted the wall out. We cut the wall and added like 55 more seats. Remember that? We put that in for growth there. Uh, and then finally the wall had to go down, uh, and we kind of referred to it as the walls of Jericho, but then nobody wanted the plywood that made the wall because if you, it's like the walls of Jericho, the Lord said don't take anything from Jericho or you'll be accursed. 
So it was like, you know, what you going to do with all that extra plywood? I don't want it. You know what I mean? It's like Jericho. I don't want nothing to do with that city. But, um, but that being said, we, we were in here, and, and, and man, I think we were like in our third or fourth year of ministry, thinking, okay, that's, you know, um, so I'll be 40 this year, and two weeks after my birthday means I've been here 10 years as pastor. And so, anyway, we were here, so I think we're like third year. So, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of back at, around the back or whatever. Um, always like early when I go places, so I got a lot of time to mingle. Um, but, but anyway, so I was over there, and, uh, or late, whatever. And so I got back over here, and uh, one of our ladies comes up to me, one of our, um, one of our ladies. I'll tell you who it was. Uh, it was Miss uh, Bert Allen. Um, wonderful lady, if you know Miss Bert. If you don't, you need to get to know her. She's awesome. But we were, she come up to me, and it wasn't judgmental, it was just a concern. We didn't have an a, a ERT, or we didn't have safety or security at the time. And uh, I love our safety and security team, by the way. You guys do a great job. But we were back here, and um, Ms. Burke comes up to me. And maybe one of our other ladies, I can't remember exactly. But she says, I just want you to know that there's a the man I, that's drunk here this morning. He's in the service. Now, it wasn't condescending. It, there again, it wasn't just, she just wanted to make me aware. And, and I appreciated that. Uh, she did her job, and then she was off. So I'm thinking, okay, wow, how do I handle a intoxicated man or woman, whatever the case is, in a service? How do I, how do I approach that? So I'm praying for instantaneous wisdom. Uh, what do I do? Because, you know, one of our members come to me out of concern, so I have to address it in some way, but it needs to be the right way. How do I do that? Well, I'm praying, God, okay, this is where I need you to endow me with wisdom, like, right, like, right now. Like, the next step I take, I need to know exactly what to do, because I didn't get up this morning rehearsing what would I say to a drunk man. Um, I just didn't. I was, you know, it was the last thing on my mind. So, here we go. We got a situation, just, just like this morning, right here, we're in service, and there's a man that's in this room, half the room we're sitting in this morning, and he's... He is drunk. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, well, how does she know that he's drunk? You know, how does she know that um, drunkenness can be not only from alcoholism, but it can be just, you know, in a state of mind or condition from overindulgence and whatever. And so I'm walking over to this guy. She points him out to me, and, and I'm walking to this guy, and I see him. And it is very apparent that it is alcohol. You can smell it. Um, from a far off, and, and that's one thing, I, that's one thing, they say you have five senses, uh, we're good if we do, I guess, have at least that many, uh, but one of my senses that are least keen, or maybe just obsolete, is smelling, I cannot hardly smell anything, um, I'm always stopped up, or just whatever, but I cannot smell good, it has to be potent for me to smell, and so uh, I get over there, and I don't have to get too far, and I can just, it's just like he bathed in it, I'm like, wow, that is very, very strong. Um, he wasn't, you know, I, I guess I, I've seen drunk people before, and there's some people who can be violent. Some people drink, they like to fight. Some people drink, they like to drive. The people, you saw, some people like, just like to drink and just sit there and chill or whatever. So anyway, you see different personalities come out through this. And this guy, he's just chilling. So number one, I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe it took this guy getting drunk before he'd come to church. I don't know. Uh, if that's the case, then maybe we need to look into that. No, just kidding. But anyway... But, but we were over there, and I was like, okay, what do we do? So I walk up to the guy, um, and this is real life stuff. This isn't just reading a chapter, you know, just reading out of the Bible. And say, okay, all right, good, everybody feel good, let's go home. They had a great day, yay team, you know, whatever. This is like, you got to live out your faith right here. You got to not just come to church, but you got to be the church. You got to live it out loud. And I walk up to him, and I say, good morning. And he slurs through his speech, and um, I said, we're glad you're here. Uh, but it wasn't like I was just singling them out because I've been talking to a lot of people at this time. And it was a genuine, you know, what do I do? And God just said, let him be. He's welcome in my house. And so I said, hey, we're glad to see you this morning. Glad you're here. If you need anything, let us know. And, and I walked off. Then I went, you know, because really our usher team, led by Jason, is, we have a great team of ushers and, and greeters. We just do. And I appreciate um, Jason and his hard work. Uh, but part of their job then, even now, they'll patrol. They don't just take up money or just meet people in the parking lot. 
you know, they're, they're looking out. They're going to make sure that, um, that nobody uh, gets to me. I don't know how they feel about you. No, just kidding. This is everybody. But, uh, but, but, but they really do. They just, they're looking. You know, they're just really paying attention. And so I went up to them and I said, hey, there is a guy. He's sitting over here and he is definitely drunk. Just, you know, keep an eye on him. And, uh, and not to say, now, if somebody wanted to get real loud, you can't let a bad apple spoil the bunch. I mean, if he did, he just had to be, you know, escorted to another room where he could be maybe talked to and contained a little bit better. But, but he didn't. And so we preach through the message. We sing, preach, pray. We, we worship the God. Uh, we get to the doors, and there was like a set of double doors, like, in between the columns as you walked out that way. Uh, there weren't any over there at the time because that building wasn't even there. And I'm standing at the door at the end of service, and he comes through, and tears are running down his face. And I'm thinking, wow, this guy has been touched. God has spoke to him this morning. He is, because he, was, he wasn't like that at all when I talked to him in the beginning. And he just come up, and he shook my hand, and he said, thank you. And he walked out. That was it. I've never seen that guy again. Now, we do know in the Bible that there are angels unaware. But I will say, an angel would not have come into church um, in a drunken condition. So that's not an angel. But I will tell you that it was a test um, for this church. And I, I really related then, probably more than ever. It taught me a lesson. I'm sure it, it helped others who come in contact with it. But here's what it taught me as a, as a pastor, as a Christian. Because I'm a Christian before I'm a pastor. Um, I was and will be. But it taught me that I just need to love people where they are and see them for what they can be and not for who they are. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't die on the cross so a man or woman could stay in the state or condition that they're in. He died for them so that they could get out of that condition or that state that they're in. And so I, I'm less than a man and I'm less than a Christian if I don't love people where they are. Now, that guy didn't smell like me. That guy didn't act like me. Uh, that guy didn't do like I do. And many times we base our standards on that. But that told me a lot. And it also told me a lot about the character of this church and this body because all those who come in contact and knew that never turned their nose up, and they never murmured under their breath. Uh, they just said, hey, it's a legitimate concern. We just want to let somebody know about it because we feel like that's our responsibility, and that's, you should. But it wasn't like, oh, that guy's got to go. Because here's the thing. If we kick this guy out on the street, then who's going to love him out there? You know, the world might wrap their arms around him, but then he's just going to fall deeper and deeper in his state of condition. And so... The church has to wrap their arms around these people and say, look, we love you. It doesn't necessarily mean we're agreeing or condoning what you're doing, but we're going to love you where you are. And I believe that's the same thing that Jesus would do if he was sitting in the seat right beside you today as a member of this congregation. He would love them right where they are. And so when we look at this story, think about that for a moment and think about how relationships are relative, because I will make this statement before we dive in, there's some people that you will have to establish a relationship with before you will ever be able to introduce them to Jesus. I mean, I, and I want you to always know that your first priority as a Christian is to introduce Christ and introduce people to Jesus. But I want you to know that there's some people, unless you establish a relationship with them first, you will never have the opportunity or the platform to tell them about Christ. You just need to love people. Um, you don't need to judge people. You're not their judge. You're not their God. Uh, nor do you want that responsibility. I don't want it. Uh, I don't want the job of one day sorting out who's going to go to heaven and who's not. Um, that's God, and, and he's God and Lord, and, and amen, praise the Lord. But, but I will tell you today that we as a church need our arms open wide and not sitting here with the folded arm mentality of knowing that everybody knows that they're welcome in this congregation. Um, I I'll also tell you this, this most recent event that happened right here in this church. Um, I mentioned this, I think, on a Wednesday night, but I want to mention it again this morning so you don't miss it. Because there again, this is real-life stuff happening around us, and it is relative to what we're talking about this morning. 
it was on the morning that we went to the river and baptized, our, our most recent baptism at Red the River, there was a guy who come to me at the end of the second service, and he said, during the service, you made mention of homosexuality or heterosexuality, and he says, and when you got to homosexuality, he said, most preachers, this was just his opinion, most preachers would have stopped right there and then just, just harped on it and just drilled it and just talked about it, how bad it was and everything else. He said, but you didn't. He said, when you, said, when you talked about it, you talked about it out of love and concern. And you also mentioned that you didn't agree with it, but then at the same time, you didn't bash it either. And he said, I just want to tell you, I appreciate that. He said, because I haven't been in church in 17 years. And he said, and I'm a homosexual. And he said, and I live in Columbia, but I was here today visiting. And he said, and I will come back to this church all the, because of the way you talked about the homosexuality. He said, and he knew where we stood. And you can't give an inch on that, you know, because if you move the line, then there are no lines. Uh, we have to stand up for what we believe in, but we also need, we can also send a message to people, and that's obvious because God has given us this real life example that people can come to this church. It's not that Lebanon condones it. Now, there's no way that that person could be a member of this church. There's no way that person could teach a class in this church. They, they couldn't do that. They couldn't lead anybody spiritually because they need to first be led to the well. They need that. But unless, unless we show them the way, how will they know the way? Uh, you know, remember when the eunuch um, was out in the desert of Gaza and God led Philip, Philip out there by the Spirit? Remember when he said, he said, Philip said, um, he said, you know, he got talking with him and everything. He was led by the Spirit. And, and the eunuch said, how can I know to be saved? How can I know to be baptized lest somebody show me the way? You know, there are people out there who really need the Lord, and there are some people who are really searching for him. They may not know him by name yet. They may not know what he's about, but what they're really looking for first, before they'll ever find Jesus, they're going to find you. And then you're going to be the one who's going to lead them. So we don't need to turn our nose up, and we don't need to turn our back on these people who are not living like we're living, because truth is, we're just as much sinners as they are. And, and, and we need to acknowledge that, that we love the Lord and we need to lead these people. And so I know there are some people who are hard to love. Trust me, this I know. But I'm just telling you, with God's help, we can indeed love them and lead them to the Lord. And so, and truth is, if, if, you, if it's that hard to love them, then maybe we need to say, look, that person needs Jesus. Amen? <laughs> There's some people we know need the Lord. Amen? Amen. It might just be our job to help lead them to Jesus Christ. Um, and, and so I want to show you something here. It's, it's, it's really awesome that our church is like this, and it's not that I'm here today harping on how we need to be this way, because I feel like we are this way, but we need to look at it in a sense of appreciation and how we need to extend our boundaries and, and open, up, open up our horizons so that we can love people right where they are and love them for who they are. So remember, it's not a body with a soul. It's a soul with a body. If you look at people that way, you will not see color. You will not see culture. You will not see all the things that stop us from engaging in a relationship. You need to look at people say, that's a soul right there. That person, right. You know the people who, the news is crazy this week, right? I mean, man, there's so many things going on in, in, in our best terminology. It's just crazy. It's nuts. What are people thinking? People just going in and just killing people. Did you know the person that has pulled the trigger and all those people? Everybody who's a part of ISIS, do you know that every single one of them, Jesus Christ died for every one of them just as much as he died for you? Just as much. And, and watch this. Here's the difference in people's accepting Christ or rejecting Christ. You're sitting in church today wanting to live and love Christ. Those people out there wanting to hate Christ and hate Christians and kill people. We're still people. We're all capable of doing the same things. It's the choices that we make. It's accepting Christ or rejecting Christ. That is the difference in people and in humanity. And so let's look at this, being a friend of sinners, and we want Lebanon Church to be um, a friend to all sinners. All right, so let's look at this. Uh, what would Jesus do? I put that on there, just a little blast from the past. WWJD. Uh, and then the question would be at the end, what would YD, what would you do? 
after hearing this message or even before this message. All right, so I got three points for you this morning. Um, let me do s- send a little shout out real quick. Um, you know that we will be getting on the plane like right after the second service. We got to go catch a plane to go to Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, we'll be gone until Thursday of this week. This is the national convention that we attend, all the Free Will Baptists that gather together. If they want to wipe Free Will Baptists out, just throw a grenade over there in Kansas City. Just kidding. Somebody might hear that. It's crazy right now. Um, but you would wipe out just about every Free Will Baptist preacher on the planet. And, um, and so we'll be going to that convention that we attend every year. Um, so I said that to say this, my class that I have, we will not be having class tonight. So come in what they told us as kids, big church at 6 o'clock tonight, okay? Um, number one, live the life. Number two, love their life. Number three, lift a life. That is our outline this morning in the three points that I want us to pick up right here in chapter 7. Look at it with me, if you will, beginning with verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired that he would eat with them, talking about Jesus. <clears throat> and he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet or to supper. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, underlined, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. And stood at the feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears. And did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. Verse 39, And now when the Pharisees which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of a woman this is that touched him, for she is a sinner. Stop for just a moment. Jesus right now is reading this man's thoughts because notice this man says, it says here that this man thought within himself. So he did not verbalize what we just read. Only Jesus is hearing and knowing his thoughts. Just like he knows our thoughts this morning. Just like he knows everything in our heart and our mind, which is scary sometimes. Amen, church. But the thing is, he knows exactly Uh, what this man's saying. Look at verse 40. And Jesus answering in him. Look, Jesus is answering his thoughts. It says here, Simon. The guy's name was Simon. He says, I have somewhat to say unto thee, and he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor. Notice he gives this parable here. It says, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors, and one owed him 500 pence and the other 50. Uh, Let's just say today, Um, that somebody owed you $500 and somebody owed you $50. Let's just use that this morning. Look at verse 42. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. It says here that tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the most. Verse 43, Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most, the one that owed $500. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he said to the woman and said unto Simon, he said, see us this woman here. He said, since I entered into thy house, thou gave me no water for my feet. Number two, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. And my head with oil thou didst not anoint but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment from her alabaster box wherefore i say unto thee her sins which are many are forgiven for she loved much but to whom little is forgiven the same loveth little and he said unto her thy sins are forgiven and they sat at meat or at the dinner table with him, began to say within themselves, Who is he that forgiveth sins also? In verse 50, the final verse of this chapter 7, it says, And he saith unto the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Now notice this. Go back to chapter 5 just for a moment. Luke chapter 5. Look at verse 29. 
Luke 5, 29, And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with them. Now I want you to know the word publicans mean sinners. Look at verse 30. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answered and said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. He says, I came to call the righteous. He says, but sinners. Came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, go back over to Luke chapter 7, and let me give you this very first one. Ready? Live the life. What does that mean? I want you just to be real. No matter where people see you at, be real. One thing we pound and pound and pound here is be real. No matter where people see you or meet you, doesn't matter if you're at Walmart, it doesn't matter if you're at uh, the grocery store, it doesn't matter if you're in your home, uh, if you're in your barn, if you're at church, be the same. Be real to who you are. Um, one thing is, here's the persona. I, I ask a lot of people who are unchurched about the church because I want to get their perspective. I want to know what they're thinking. And they talk about the church and how there is so much fake, so much imitation, so much hypocrisy. Now, when I say church, I'm not talking about Lebanon church. I'm talking about the universal church. I'm talking about all people who are born again believers. Now, I know that people stereotype. And somewhat we could be offended today that some people would think that we're like that. But the truth is, there are some people that you see out and about on day-to-day -day living that the thought will run through your mind. You'll start stereotyping. You'll start saying, well, that person there must be, or this person must be like, and you had to get that thought out of your head. I mean, it's just like it'll run right through there. You'll say, well, I had to watch that one there. That one there was steal from me. Or that one right there, that one's this or that. And, and we have to be careful about that because every sailor don't cuss, all right? And, and you know, people say, well, cuss like a sailor. Well, right then, if you see a sailor, well, he must cuss, you know, or curse. You know, no, that's not the case, amen? All right, so what, what happens is that's stereotyping. We're saying they're just like that. Um, we look at the church and we know that we all are sinners. How many of you would agree with me this past week, you sinned? Amen. Amen. I sinned. Now, I'm not saying, well, look, man, good deal. I got me a license now. I can just go live it up. Mm -mm. That's not what I mean by living the life. What I mean is by living the life is we have to try Christianity on every day. We have to practice. It's a practice. And so we live this life. We go out and say, you know what? I mean, guys, I'll tell you right now, I'll tell you straight up. There are a lot of things. If this book didn't say it, I wouldn't do it. There are a lot of things that make a deciding factor in my life based on what this word says. There are a lot of things out there that Mac wants to do. But then I say, no, nope, the Bible says I can't. Now, does that mean I follow it, you know, every day perfectly? Absolutely not. But this is the deciding factor many times. It's what tips the scale in what I do or don't do. Remember, we can get in trouble for what we do, but we also can get in trouble for what we don't do. So we have to understand that's both sides. We can't just sit back and fold our arms and say, well, no, I'm not doing it. Listen, sometimes not doing is just as bad as doing. And so we have to be real. Jesus had a reputation. Get this, ready? Everybody in here has got a reputation. Every single one of you. Here's what happens as pastor or as friend. You, you relate with me for a moment, ready? There are some people you know in your circle of life. The minute somebody mentions that name to you, you immediately identify them in their mind by the way they live their life. Let's just think about it a minute. Uh, if somebody mentions to you the store at the fork of the road, first thing comes to your mind, Sunday lunch. Because they open now. And it's good. You, the first thing comes to your mind, you ready, ready? They got good fried chicken down there. There you do. You say, boy, them pork chop, mm-hmm, yep, yep. Or you might say that macaroni and cheese, it's greasy and cheesy, but it's good. 
I mean, you know, there's just a lot of things. That, I mean, but right time, you start identifying them with that. Ready? Let's try somebody else. What, watch this. Ready? Billy Graham. What comes to your mind? Preacher. Holy man. Led a lot of people to Jesus. See what's happening? Every time a name is mentioned. Ready? Now, this right here, watch this one. This can get a little confusing. Ready? Jimmy Swaggart. See? See what just happened? For those of you who know, Lady Gaga. See? Ready? LeBron James. See there? Mel Tillis. See? See what's happening? Everybody can relate. Clint Eastwood. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Yeah? Hey? Make my day pump. Hey, hey, you feel lucky? Hey, this, watch this. Watch, um, Atlanta Braves. <laughs> it ain't the 90s no more, baby. <laughs> you see? See what's happening? Every time I mention a name to you, all right, something comes to your mind. You know, Dallin Funeral Home, McLeod Hospital, Carolinas. Florence County, Lake City, Darlington, Cades, Columbia, Agriculture Fair, State Fair. You see, we identify places, people, things, and immediately our mind goes to a memory or something that has been said in our midst or an experience. I mentioned last week Cool Ranch Doritos. You know why I don't eat Cool Ranch Doritos? Because I had a virus one time, and I ate Cool Ranch Doritos, and I threw them up. And it didn't smell good going in, and it was worse coming out. So I can't stand the smell of Cool Ranch Doritos. My mouth starts watering for all the wrong reasons. So if I smell it, I run. I just cannot eat a Cool Ranch Dorito. I've tried it since then, and, I'll, uh, and I have a strong stomach. I'll start gagging. I can't do it. By the way, I love to see somebody gag. But anyway, <laughs> but my, not because they sick, but like when they stick their toothbrush too far to clean their tongue, uh, i like, <laughs> you tripped me out. But anyway, none of this. But, but the thing is, my thing is, you got to understand that you identify this. Why? Because there's a reputation, right? Are there some places, some places in Florence that you will never eat at again? Why? Why is Chick-fil-A the best fast food place there is? Guaranteed just about 100%. I'll go 99 because nobody's perfect. Most everybody in here, if you go around from all the fast food places in Florence County, you've probably had your best experiences at Chick-fil-A. Why? Because of the way they're managed, the way they're run, the way they're trained, the way they're taught, the people are respectful, the people actually represent Christ. That, why is that? Well, see, you know, you see, it's the way they've been trained, the way they've been still. You, there's some service there you don't get at other places. You just don't. And what do people love better than even the food itself? Good service. You go somewhere and get bad service, it don't matter how good the food is, you're not going back. Churches are the same way. People have experiences at churches. And the reason there's a lot of people sitting on their couch or in their bed still this morning is because they had a bad experience. And people will relate church the same way. So what is our job? Our job is to have a reputation that we represent Christ, that we, we scream we're not perfect, but we will love you where you are. Jesus Christ had a reputation. Now, unlike anything else, he was perfect. But this woman goes to him, why? Because he has the reputation of helping people. There are people that you know right now, if somebody mentioned your name, say, he'd give you the shirt off his back. Why? Because of his reputation. But there are some people that says right now, if you mention a name, they say, don't go to him. He don't care about nobody but himself. He's out for number one. Amen, church. Is this real stuff or not? All right, well, we're no different than that. We are exactly the same as that. There are some people who will ask, they'll ask this question. You've been asked this question. When you invited into this church, they'll say, well, does so-and-so still go there? Because if they do, they ain't coming. Why? Because of reputation. Reputable. We have to understand that God can help us. But we need to go, if we're not living the life, if we're not being real, then we're not going to be a friend of sinners and we're not going to lead people to Jesus Christ. 
So number one, you've got to have the reputation that you'll help people and that you do love people and that you're more of a giving person. You'll give more than you want to receive. That's how you have to be in order for a sinner to come. Because there's a reason this woman felt, get this, look at this picture for a minute, ready? This woman felt like she was welcome. Now, notice, she is a prostitute, by the way. This woman is a prostitute. Um, and I mentioned to you just the other week at Bible school, there was a prostitute who came right in here and sat down here and was with her children. She was right here. And I hope she comes back. I had not seen her since. I'm looking for her, but I hope she'll come. Um, because she needs the gospel. She needs the Lord. And, and she, she's still living that life. But I want her to know that she's welcome in this church. Uh, and that we are a friend of sinners. But this woman's a prostitute. Get this. You live that life. And, and by the way, then there was shame for sin. There's no shame now. People just go out and do what's right in their own mind. So I, want, I do want you to know that on a greater level, there was a great sense of humility and shame. Like, you know what? I'm so embarrassed for the way I live my life. That was more so then than now. But this woman walks in to get this. She walk, it'd be just like if you had Jesus over for supper tonight. He's sitting at your table. This woman walks in your house. You hadn't invited her. You know her reputation. And she comes in there and she starts right behind Jesus Christ. She begins weeping and she's broke because her spirit, she's just so convicted. But she heard that Jesus could help her. See, here's what people need to know in this community. That if you go to Lebanon Church, you'll get what you're looking for. Having that reputation that they will meet you where you are. That they will not judge you, but they will love you. And so they, they'll come. They'll come to that. Because why? It's real. It's real church. It's real life. And so this woman goes to Jesus because he says, I know he'll help me. He won't judge me. He'll love me. And so she comes to him. And because why? Because Jesus is living the life of a Christian. He's showing us how to do it. Look at the second one. We have to love their life. See, what has to happen in our hearts and our mind is totally not natural. It's totally not easy. But it's loving other people's life. That their life is of value to you. Watch this here. You have to be not only of a reputation that you'll help people and not judge people but love them, but number two, you have to be approachable. Have you ever run into some people that are just not approachable? I mean, the look on their face is enough. Have you ever seen those people? They look like they were baptized in pickle juice, right? I mean, I mean, they just look so bitter. I mean, I've never seen adults that could roll their bottom lip out like that. It's like they've never lost it since their childhood. You know what I'm saying? And, and it's just like, come on, man. I mean, they look just so, so bad. And, 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 and I want to be around positive people, don't you? I want to be around people who's full of life, don't you? Uh, I want to be around people who can elevate me, don't you? Uh, you want to be around people that are not just fake, but they're real. They're, they're tapping into the well of life, and they're just, they're real. And, and so you want to be approachable. Let me tell you one thing that will help you with that. Smiling. Mm-hmm. You got to smile. Do you have a reason to smile? Somebody reached down and raised you up from death. Somebody has promised you a place. you got a seat at the table. You mean to tell me that somebody's giving me a seat at the Lord's table, it's got my name on it, and there's going to be bread baked from heaven's oven? Yeah, that's mine. Yeah, I'm happy about that. Amen? You don't even have to pop a hole in it and put no ain't your mama or no cane syrup. That sucker's going to come ready, man. It's going to be so good. Yeah, we got a reason to smile. He loved me when nobody else could. He saved me when nobody else could. He saw the best in me when nobody else would even give me a second glance. I'm telling you that we got a reason to smile and be real. We're not perfect, but we're forgiven. We're on our way to heaven. We're no longer on our, this is close to hell as we're going to get. Amen. And we're on our way to heaven, and we're loving it. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. And so you got to love their life. I want other people to have what I've got. I want to share. It's too much for one person to have by themselves. You know what I mean? You just got to go and share it. That's what I love about so many of you right now. I mean, you got, you're growing gardens, right? Man, you're blessing all kinds of people with your squash and your zucchini 
and your sweet corn and, 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 and tomatoes and, and cucumbers. I mean, that's awesome, man. You're just going out blessing people, amen? Some people looking around like, they ain't come to my house yet. <laughs> but after this message, I know they come and preach it. Thank you so much. You know, I mean, it's just like, you know, why, why you're doing you so much. You can't, you, you don't want it to waste. You know why you take it? Because you love planting something and you love to see it grow. Man, you don't realize just how much Christian you got in you. I mean, that's what it's all about, planting a seed and watching it grow. I mean, the hard work is pulling all the weeds out, you know, pulling all that sin. And, man, you're like, man, boy, I wish they wouldn't eat that fruit in the garden, eating all them thorns and thistles and pulling them just out of there. But anyway, but you pull that back so it can grow, and then it yields fruit. And then you take that fruit, and you're like, oh, man, what are we going to do with all this abundance that God did? God grew this. He blessed this. And so you, know, you start giving it all kind of people. Why? Because you don't want it to go to waste. So you got to look at what God's given you in the abundance of the grace and mercy and forgiveness and love and say, oh man, there's so much here. I don't want it to go to waste. I don't want it to spoil. I don't want it to ruin. I got to just go give it to other people, man. It's just so good. And so you start blessing people because you've been a blessing and God's helped you and he's given you so much. And so you love their life and you want people to have the joy and experience what you're experiencing and just having them little Moments with the Lord, man, it's just so awesome when God gives you what we call little gold nuggets, you know. He gives you, man, he gives you some, some food, some spiritual food, and you're so excited. So what happens is if you have the joy of the Lord in your life, you're going to be approachable. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some people, even if they smile, they still look mean. You know what I'm saying? It's like when they smile, it looks sarcastic. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, <laughs> I get you, you know. You know what I mean? come near me I'll bite your ear off or something I'm like man I mean it's like when they you know it's just like some people in church they can't whisper I mean it trips me out right I mean people like lean over it's like hey did you see I'm like man easy with that I mean man everybody get this guy a microphone I mean I mean it's like you some people can't whisper you know and it's like some people just can't be because they rough and I mean it's kind of like no offense now I know there's some butchers you know but it's like names give people character I mean if you know a guy his name's butch you know what I'm saying he's a he's a tough guy you know what I'm saying there's nothing feminine about butch you know I mean and, and so it's just like character you give people's names and and, and and you know stuff like that and so you have a character about you but whether you smile or not let the love of the Lord come out of you. Um, I was telling one of my daughters, I won't say which one, which I only have two, amen. But by the time I said, I said, we were having a little vacation time this week, and, and I told my daughter I was hanging around them a little bit more than I normally do, and I was like, hey, I said, you got the Lord in you, right? She better say, yeah, you know. But she said, yeah. I said, turn him loose. I said, won't you let him out? I said, your face and your countenance, you look so miserable. I said, you're on vacation. We eating all the ice cream. We can get our hands on it. I said, we, we are blessed. And I said, and we can walk in air conditioning at any time. I said, we don't know how to stay out in this heat. I said, why aren't you smiling? I said, you look so miserable. I said, why are you so miserable? I said, if you look that miserable, then you have lost sight of the goodness in your life. See, it's not that the goodness is gone. You've just stopped looking at it. I said, come on, girl. And what, what it reminds me of, and I told her this, I said, I said, it's like you got Jesus handcuffed. You say, preacher, there ain't no way nobody can handcuff Jesus. Oh, yes, you can. Hey, the only person, the only people, the only creation, any creature that ever handcuffed Jesus was the people who arrested him in the garden and when they did they 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 handcuffed him and they carried him and put him on trial get this when we read that story man it makes me mad i want to stand up and fight for jesus christ like peter did but let me tell you what happens when people sin see we don't realize this but these sinners out there that are sinning and doing things that are unbiblical and unchurch and unchristian like and un unladylike or See, what happens is many times when we talk about them, we don't realize this, but we're putting Jesus on trial. We're saying by our actions that Jesus' blood is not enough. See, you got to be careful in condemnation, and that condemnation tone is that when we start saying these people and this and that and all this kind of stuff, 
then we got to remember, you might be putting Jesus on trial. And by the way, and by doing that, you're not allowing Jesus to live through you. You've you got Jesus handcuffed, and he can't even move or do anything. See, my thing is, all I want you to do in your life is open up the jail cell, take the handcuffs off of Jesus, and let Jesus, this one we sing about, Yahweh, who is living in you, let him out. Turn him loose. Take the handcuffs off. Let Jesus be Jesus in you. And let that love that put him on the cross, do you know that that same very love is living in you right now? And it's just waiting to show itself, to reveal itself. And you say, preacher, it's hard. Preacher, I know it is, y'all. I'm out there living and loving, I'm telling you. I mean, to be a preacher, you've got to really not master it, but you've got to learn how to love people. Because you like get all their dirt and everything. You know what I'm saying? People don't call you up and say, hey, preacher, I just want to tell you that I'm doing right today. You don't call the office and say, hey, I'm calling right. I just want to meet with the preacher because I'm going to tell him I can't get this smile off my face. People don't call for that. People call because they can't get the smile back. They call because something's going on. People call because they got problems. They don't call because they got solutions. So my point is, love people. Love them right there where you are. Man, they some people that live in your house that need, need you to love them, man. We need to take it. We need to pray today. Here's the biggest thing. The whole objective today of this thing is we need to take every judgmental, stereotyping, categorizing bone out of our body and, and know that you are not any better than any of these people now you're better off because you've accepted Christ but these people are just like you and and, and we, we need to be a friend to sinners and you know what man I love about Jesus stay with me now we're gonna bring this thing to a close and that doesn't mean I'm halfway I'm almost there but the thing is Jesus look at what he does so this woman comes up to him and this is what he points out ready he points out three things. He says, did you know? He told Simon. Now, the biggest thing about church is, well, here's the thing you got to know. The more you learn about church and the more you learn about God, the more pharisaical you can become. You know what the biggest temptation is for growing in your faith and knowing more about Jesus? Is don't be hypocritical and don't be judgmental because here's what you start doing. Ready? All right, so like... Um, like this, this, is, this, is, this, is, uh, you, this is where sinners live, ready? This is where you come from, all right? Right there. Now, as you walk with Christ, you go in the opposite direction of where you used to be. That's what we do. He leads us in his path, which is opposite of that way. But watch, as we grow, we advance. That's what he wants. We're maturing in our faith. We're getting off the milk on the meat. But watch what happens in the temptation of a Christian. We look back, and we see where we came from. And then we realize there are other people that are still standing there. And because there's a gap now between where they are, where we used to be, and where we are now, we look and say, what's wrong with them? Why ain't they, why ain't they doing it? Watch, notice the judgmental, the condescending tone. When I don't realize it, but I don't even trust the Holy Spirit of God in that person to do his work. See, I've got to trust the Spirit of God that lives in me. And oh, by the way, I wouldn't even be this far if it wasn't for the Spirit of God teaching me and showing me. We all learn in different ways. We all get it in different ways. But we have to understand, this is the biggest temptation. Don't look back. You know what happened to Lot's wife when she turned back? She turned into a pillar of salt. Don't look back. Just don't ever forget where you come from. So you'll be grateful and thankful. But keep moving forward. That's why he says keep your, keep your focus. We, we got our eyes on the prize and we're, we're running the race. We're living life day by day until he comes or calls for us. But if you keep our eyes on Jesus... The one thing I love about our God, 
is he says, put your eyes on him, and then he'll put your eyes on them. So you can't look at the sinners the way you need to look at them until you first look at Jesus. So here's what it tells the Christian or the church member who's not loving sinners. If you're not loving sinners, in fact, it's a direct result of not loving the one who died for them. Because if you love him, then you love everything about him, even the part where he died for them. You see? Notice how it connects. And so now... What happens is this woman comes in, and this is what Jesus says to the pharisaical man, the religious man, the church member. He says, since I got to your house, oh, and by the way, he invited Jesus. He says, since I got here, he said, you didn't even give me no water for me to wash my feet. Remember now, this was custom. Just like you invite people into your house and pour them a glass of tea, or, or offer them something to drink, or just come in and make yourself at home. That same rhetoric, that same talk, in their custom, the first thing that happened, you just knew when you walked in, because your sandaled, dusty feet, it was custom in their culture, here's some water to wash your feet. That was just the way it was. Just like you offer people, here's the restroom if you need it, same thing. He says, since I got in your house, you didn't even offer me no water for my feet. He says, but... Ever since this woman got here, watch, the saint, the sinner. He says, since the sinner got here, she has wept. And she didn't have water, but she washed my feet with her tears. That's the sinner now. He says, since I got here, you haven't even given me a kiss. See, that there again, that's just what they did. See, we shake hands or maybe hug. We don't do a lot of the kissing unless we, like, really got it like that. You better really have it like that before you puck her up. Amen? Amen. Like, I need to really know you. <laughs> but he says, you hadn't even kissed me since I've been in your house. He says, but since, ever since the sinner got here, she has not stopped kissing my feet. Man. Third and last, he says, <clears throat> he says, church, remember, he says, ever since I got to your house, you haven't offered me any oil. There again, it was custom because the oil refreshed your body with fragrance and it covered your skin from the hot sun. He says, you haven't even offered me that. He says, but ever since the sinner got here, she's not stopped taking oil from her alabaster box and putting it on me incredible and you know what I found in myself this week guilty guilty as charged that the Lord says you are my child He says, but ever since I got there, you hadn't kissed me or took. See, when Mary, when she came in with that alabaster box, this prostitute, this sinner, her box was everything she had. She didn't have nothing else. She didn't have a house. She didn't have a car. She didn't have anything. Every bit of her money she made in prostitution bought the oil that was in the box. You mean to tell me Jesus let money from prostitution buy the oil that was rubbed on him? Yeah. And he told me, he says, I have an obligation to sinners. 
But I'm not going to let sinners do my job either. Jesus said. <laughs> and you know what I love? He didn't look at her and say, don't touch me. You know where you've been. He didn't say, notice what well, the third thing was, you got to, uh, you know, number one, you've got to uh, live the life. You've got to love their life. But thirdly, you've got to live the life. See, you've got to take that person, you've got to lift them up. Do you know what it meant to that woman to hear Jesus say that to him? It's just like him saying, Jesus sitting there, he was bragging on her. And if Jesus brags on you audibly, you know, if he, you know Jesus is standing here today and he's in this pulpit, and, and I believe, and you've got to understand this too, when, when God speaks, many times he speaks through me and through his teachers to you. And so when I speak today, I hope it's fresh from heaven and from his heart to your heart. But he says, Casey, even though you've been through so much sickness, you still love me. He says, he says, Shannon, the testimony you have, you don't realize how many people's lives you have touched. He says, let me tell you about Phil Tedder. Phil Tedder, I had to reach way down in the miry clay to a man that was headed in the opposite direction. And though he fights and battles, he's still my son, still my son. He says, let me tell you about Melissa who was raised by two godly parents. He says, this girl has stayed true to me. He said, let me tell you about old Steve. Steve almost died. He did die. He said, and Steve is here living out every day, the rest of his life for me. He said, let me tell you about Jerry. Jerry has Parkinson's. But he still comes to the house of God and loves me. He said, let me tell you about you, Lee, and Reese. They lost the most precious thing in their life, their daughter. But they realized that they're going to see her again. And that above their love for Gwen... They love Jesus Christ above that, and it still keeps them true. When they could have turned their back, when they could have went the other way and said, why, God, did you do this? We're going to trust you because you are our Lord and our Savior, and we're going to live out the rest of our lives for you. Let me tell you about Jimmy. Jimmy was a hardcore man, rough and tough and calloused, a man's man, a hardworking man, worked out of town every week, to provide for his family, but his wife Libby wouldn't stop praying for him because she loved her husband, but she knew that Jesus could change him. And Jesus saved him. Let me tell you about my let me tell you about my son Perry Bent, one who took care of his wife Dora, hand and foot who wiped her, who cleaned her, who fed her, who did for her when other men would have left her and would have been unfaithful. He stood true to his wife. He said, let me tell you about Benji and Melissa who have taken kids. God didn't bless them with the ability to have kids. But had he done that, then perhaps they wouldn't have helped rescue the kids they have and they will become great men of God because of the love of Christ in these two. Greg Hyman, who is a servant, who loved his mama more than life itself. He said, let me tell you about this man. This man's integrity. He's real. He'll do for anybody, anytime. One of the greatest men you'll ever meet who loves the Lord, who just wants to please God. Let me tell you a 
about Chad. Chad has suffered great loss in his life. His mama, she can come to know the Lord. His biggest desire is just to know for sure that his dad will be in heaven with him along with his mom and his family. Let me tell you about Debbie. Debbie's got a heart as big as this room. How she loves people. Let me tell you about Annie Severance. This woman is just as beautiful. This is what the Lord said. She's just as beautiful on the inside as she is on the outside. Let me tell you about DJ. And the Lord says, we ain't got time for all of that. <laughs> DJ Smith is one of the greatest men in this church. Because of his personality, you may never get to know him. Not that he has a bad one. He just likes to slide in and slide out. He's a man behind the scenes, but there ain't not a person in here he wouldn't do for. He's a great man, a great daddy. But he's got great parents. Didn't know if Clarence and Marilyn would ever come join us. But thank God because of Jesus and Ronnie Allen and Aliska and other people in this church, it brings joy to my soul to see you in this church every time you come I love you and I thank you for that and man around the room we go and there's so many people I don't know why all them people needed that encouragement more than you do but uh, the Lord is so good and if there was some way somehow that I could wash his feet this morning and take everything I've got and pour it on him. That's what I do. Let's just worship him this morning. And let me put this invitation out there to you. Let's love sinners. You know why? If no other reason, let me tell you why. Because he does. He gave his life for them. And I'm one of them. So let's love him this morning and thank him. And watch this. God, I can't wait to the opportunity you give me to love a sinner. You know what the good thing is about that? The good, bad thing? They're everywhere. So don't tell me you hadn't seen one or hadn't had the opportunity. Amen? Let's love them. And if they still choose to reject Jesus, we can't help that. But we can help if they've ever had an opportunity to reject it. Be real. Be who you are. Let's love him with everything we got. Stand with me this morning.